Richard Kuklinski is one of the most dangerous criminals we have ever come across in this state. He murdered by guns. He murdered by strangulation. He murdered by putting poison on victims' food. He did of all of this at the same time while exhibiting a normal, placid family existence. His wife, his children uh, were uninvolved in his criminal activities. Yet, uh, we are faced with uh, evidence, convicting evidence, of uh, numerous grisly murders. Hey, what's up? How you doing? What up? Welcome to the dead spot, where life is short, but death is forever. I'm Garrett. And I'm Ashley. What's up? What up? So, what are we doing? What are we, we're sitting on the couch. Yeah, Sabres playing the Bruins, scoreless right now, but we're probably going to get smacked again. Probably. What else is new? Um, not the Sabres winning, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Nope. But um, got a little bit of a th- little thing here I saw the other day. Um, we're a few days past it right now, but on December 3rd, 1992, so 31 years ago. I think we're a little past that. The, world, <laughs> the world's first text message was sent 31 years ago. Wow. Do you want to guess what it said? Hi. No. LOL. No. Goodbye. No. Peace. No. Uh, I'm out of ideas. It's about that time of year. It's two words. Merry Christmas. Yeah. So on December 3rd, 1992, Neil Papworth, an engineer working on the SMS service for Vodafone, sent the first ever text message to Richard Jarvis on his Orbitel 901 handset. The message simply said, Merry Christmas. The small act had a significant impact on the world of communication. Soon after, Nokia became the first to introduce messaging to oh its my mobile God, phones. Nokia, do you remember those phones? Yeah, the indestructible little Nokias. Yeah. That was my first phone, and it only made what and received mine? calls and played Snake. Mine was like one of those Virgin Mobile pay as you go phones that like you could only text on T9 Word. Which, listen, if you don't know what T9 Word is, then you're too young to be Then you're too to young this. for this. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you got to hit the seven four times again. Now, that mess. was elite texting. We had okay. to work for our texts. <laughs> and so then my you, parents would be like, um, you're not allowed to have any more minutes this month. <laughs> yeah, we had to pay like per text and per call. But anyway, speaking of old, um, also on December 3rd, because I saw these on the same day, the original PlayStation debuted on December 3rd, 1994. Ooh, PlayStation, that was a classic. So 29 years ago. Do you know what I love, though? Was the Nintendo 64 to play Mario Party? Yeah. Now that really tore families apart. Yeah. At least at my house. Yeah, and now it's... <laughs> and they came out with the subsequent consoles that also tear you apart. I think we should get Mario Party and play. Yeah. Just me and you. It'll tear our relationship apart. Wow. If if you're looking for an out, then I guess that's an excuse. Anyways, we have a developing crime story that was solved today by someone we know. Shout out to Becky. Yeah. She solved a crime. Yep. And we don't have any further updates currently, but she solved a crime. So here's the story. Yeah. She said, so her boyfriend's mom lost her phone and they, uh... They looked on the ring doorbell and saw that their Amazon driver actually, like, he came to drop off packages, and then he stole their phone, stole her phone out of the driveway. Her phone was dropped, like, in in their driveway, and the Amazon guy came to deliver a package, but he also took something with him. Yeah, so then her boyfriend called Amazon, but they they were not helpful, and they couldn't track her phone because the guy shut it off, so... My friend decided to jump in her car and try to go find the Amazon driver, and she did. <laughs> she did. She had pictures and everything. Yeah. Then the cops showed up. And then they arrested him. Because he needs to stand to justice. Yeah. 
We stand for justice on this it's podcast. Got a, it's got to face, face the music here, pal. Yeah. Fucking fry him. Also. Electric chair. Okay, that's really intense. Also, we should say it's. It's an ongoing it's investigation. An, okay, no. Okay. We're done with that now. It's the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Oh, yeah. Like the actual thing, not just the movie. I told Gary we should watch the movie, but he told me no. So it's not a very good movie. You just don't get it. I've, no, I no. You just don't like romance. <laughs> Except for when we watched "She's the Man" the other night. That's more of a comedy, but yeah, I get what you're saying. And listen, that uh, that one movie was hyped to us, but it wasn't that good. Yeah, it was not very good. <laughs> No Hard Feelings, starring Jennifer Lawrence and some kid who's like the new age Michael Sarah. <laughs> yeah, he literally is, though. Is, I mean, I thought it was funny, but... It was fine. It just follows a very standard formula. It wasn't formula. the Hunger Games. Like. It just followed a very standard <laughs> formula that you've seen a thousand times before. and it, I don't know. I will, will not watch again. Two out of five. I mean, I would have gave it like a 3.5 out of five. I would not watch again. All right. Well, I feel like you like to watch movies once and then never watch them again anyway in general. Well, unless they're good and unless this it's one like was not. Forrest Gump. Yeah, well, that's the best movie <laughs> ever made. So, of course, I'll watch it over and over again. Well, you know, we're, we are going to watch The Santa Claus. Forrest with Gump. With Tim Allen. Yeah. Great film. Well, we would watch the TV series, but we canceled Disney Plus. So. Well... I guess we gotta pull out our DVD. Well, no, the TV series. They made a TV series. Like yeah, a, I know. I'm saying for the movie. Yeah, I have that. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the news for today, so we'll get started here. So let's here. do it. Yeah, let's so. Let's do it. 1935. Good year. Six year. wait. <laughs> yeah, six years <laughs> after, hold on, how do I want to say this? I don't know. We, okay. Well, we just mentioned Pearl Harbor, so it's six years before Pearl Harbor happened. Yep. 1935. So what was going on? I don't know. All right, I'll tell you a I few things. I wasn't alive then. I'll tell you a few things. Believe it or not. Well, from my experience, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the president of the United States. Wasn't he, like, the president for, like, 20 years? I'm pretty sure he had two... Con- no. No. Cause he didn't he hit didn't he have four total terms? So was he the one? Years? Was he the one that did yeah. two terms and then somebody else and then two more terms? I don't know because he like created all those programs during the Great Depression. Yeah, so in the nineteen thirty five, the depression still happening. Wow, this is a history podcast now. And he also enacted the um, what do you call? Is it Social Security? I I don't know. Let's not let's not say things we don't know the answers to. I might just cut that part out. Don't quote us, because we don't know. Yeah. Uh, Persia? Persia. Became to be what we now know as Iran. Russia? Iran. Oh. Iran, Iran, <laughs> Iran. Iran. Yeah, I think that's the proper way. I think that is, for real, though. Nazi Germany, as we discussed in a previous episode. Yosef Mengele, go listen to it if you haven't, because I put a lot of work into that. But in 1935... <laughs> Nazi Germany enacted the Nuremberg Laws, which outlawed race mixing amongst its population in an effort to breed the Aryan master race. Ugh, here we go again. Well, that's <laughs> it for Nazis this time. Huey Long, nicknamed the Kingfish, who served as the 40th governor of Louisiana, was assassinated in Baton Rouge at so- age 42. His last words were reported to be either... I wonder what will happen to my poor university boys, or God, don't let me die. I have so much to do. Could you imagine, like, either really being assassinated? S- yeah, like making someone so mad that they're gonna assassinate you, or like being so like, like you're really gonna change things so people are like, gotta go. Just comes this person's with the territory. Go. Just comes with. It's all part of the job. Oh, also, I forgot. We forgot to mention the Las Vegas shooting. Yeah, there was another shooting at UNLV in Las Vegas, and apparently it was a former professor or no, some he was kind trying of to get a job there. Got denied a job, so it's uh, stay safe out there, guys. Tough out there, and you know, don't react like that. 
just take the L and move on, you know? Just take the L. Like, anyway. you don't gotta fucking, whatever. We're not here to talk about that, but, <laughs> you know, in the sports world, the Detroit Tigers won the World Series by defeating the Chicago Cubs four games to two. The, nice. Mon- the Montreal Maroons were the 1935 Stanley Cup champions after sweeping the Toronto Maple Leafs in a three-game series because fuck the Toronto Maple Leafs. Go Sabres. Anyway, in the Detroit Lions, so Detroit was, you know, doing big things that year in sports, uh, beat out the New York Giants by a score of 26-7. to You know to what? Be- the Detroit Lions, you got to watch out for them this year. Yeah, they're, they're a little they're up good. and down. You don't really know what team's going to show up, but... They're they're in it, you know. But yeah, they they beat the Giants by a score of twenty six to seven to become the NFL champions in only the sixteenth year of the league. So the NFL was sixteen years old in nineteen thirty five, hmm. and also Alan Lane's Penguin Books publishes the first paperback books, which offered quality books to the public at low prices and were <sighs> color coded as follows: orange for fiction, blue biography. And green for crime. I love a good book. The first batch included works by Ernest Hemingway and Agatha Christie. Classic. Yeah, so I figure I'd throw that in because of your books, and I'm sure at least one person listening to this reads a book once in a while. Not me. Listen, you're missing out. I read a book for a previous episode, and that was enough. I'm gonna have to wait till next year because I filled my quota. Well, good thing next year is in like three weeks, so. Well, well, <laughs> we'll wait for that. Yeah, I'll get, I'll, see you next year. I'll get out of the way early. <laughs> 1935 was also the same year the subject of today's episode was born. Richard Leonard Kuklinski was born on April 11th, 1935 in Jersey City, New Jersey, where many Polish immigrants settled in the early 1900s due to an abundance of Polish Catholic churches amidst a large Polish population and countless available blue-collar jobs. One of these Polish immigrants was Richard's father, Stanley Kuklinski. Stanley was born in Warsaw, Poland, and immigrated to Jersey City with his parents and two brothers. Stanley worked as a brakeman on the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad, also known as the DLNW, or Lackawanna Railroad, which was mostly used for delivering coal across parts of New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Richard's mother, Anna McNally, had a rough upbringing of her own after emigrating to Jersey City from Dublin, Ireland in 1904 with her parents and two older brothers. Not long after their arrival in New Jersey, Anna's father died of pneumonia, and her mother was killed when she was run over by a truck. Oh my God. So... Anna and her brothers grew up in the Sacred Heart Orphanage. Well, that's sad. Well, it's, that's how it all starts, baby. This orphanage was particularly unkind to Anna and the other children. Religion was forced upon them, and Anna had the fear of God literally beaten into her by the nuns. Before Anna was ten years old, she was raped by a priest. I saw in one source. <sighs> So it was in that manner that she had her virginity ripped away from her, as well as the light behind her eyes. The Irish eyes are no longer smiling. I'm unhappy about this. Yeah. But once once she left the orphanage at age 18, she crossed paths with Stanley, and they married in July 1925. A beautiful love story of two immigrant children finding their way to each other, moving in together and carving out a path to create a beautiful life together where everything is perfect. What is going on with this accent? (laughs) That is, until Anna discovered that her husband was a jealous, possessive, and abusive alcoholic. And cheating on her. Who would regularly toss her about the apartment and accuse her of being a whore due Mm -hmm. to her not being a virgin when they got married. Oh, God, who cares? Stanley cares i'm sure he wasn't a virgin that's that's not important it don't matter why because he's the man it's the 30s give me a break the 20s the 30s it's the man anyway being the hyper religious irish catholic she was she opted to endure the abuse and didn't tell anyone about it because as per her beliefs divorce was not an option so she just had to stick it out and deal with this bullshit In 1933, 
Anna gave birth to their first child, a boy named Florian. Oh, that's she, cute. She had hoped that having a child to care for would give Stanley a new outlook on life and would cool his temper, if even just a little bit. And I'm sure it didn't. It did not. Stanley often acted indifferent towards Florian, until he was beating him for even the most minute things that babies do, such as crying or wetting the bed. Okay, well, he's a baby. Well, he's also an angry, violent drunk. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stanley would regularly force himself on Anna, whether she allowed him to or not, without any warning, foreplay, passion, or love, a.k.a. R word. Mm-hmm. He Great, would, we're back to this. He would R word his wife. Once Richard was born on April 11, 1935, Stanley grew even more distant and more violent. So Florian was the first and Stanley was the second. But Stanley wasn't the only one handing out beatings to the Kuklinski boys. Even Anna would not hesitate to physically discipline them. Oftentimes, she would use a broomstick which, according to Richard, she had broken over him more than once. Anna believed that harsh discipline and a religious education went hand in hand, so Richard was raised rigidly Catholic, attended Catholic school, and even served as an altar boy. I feel like everyone that went to Catholic school, like, was an altar person. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's uh, mandatory or not, but... Um, I would think so. You're learning all the shit anyway, so you might as well put it to use. I don't know. I didn't go to Catholic school. I went to public school. I, uh, yeah, but I had to go to religion classes on Sundays. No, oh, me too. I hated yeah. it. Yeah. Sundays are the day of rest, which is ironic because that's like the Lord's Day, but, and I don't want to do Lord stuff, but I had to. I mean, it's a day of rest, but I feel like I don't get to rest. Not anymore. That's life, baby. You have to do laundry. Yeah, well, do you? No. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Anyway, Stanley would often beat them with a belt, even for the smallest of infractions, like I mentioned with Florian, and they quickly grew scared of their father. Richard would eventually become so terrified of him that just the sight of him would cause him to pee in his little pants, which warranted even more beatings. Oh. I believe it's... I, I mentioned it a little bit later, but I believe it's in his one interview. He said, um, you know, when he was a kid and his his father would come home, he would say hi to him and welcome him home, and he would just be greeted with a stiff smack to the face. I hate this guy. Yeah. Well, you will. Even more. Even more? Yeah. So I just mentioned that he, you know, whipped him with a belt, like classic. But it wasn't just for whipping little boy butts. Stanley would also wrap the large, thick belt around his clenched fist. You know, wrap it. And then punch them with it. What is literally wrong with this guy? Usually, most often, right in the head. So, pop, pop. Pop, pop. Pop, pop. Okay. Okay. February 1, 1941. Another day of the Kuklinski boys enduring beatings from their father. On this particular day, Stanley wound his belt around his knuckles and punched Florian several times in the back of his head, knocking him out cold as he fell to the floor. Which, unfortunately, was nothing new. So these kids gotta have, like, some serious brain trauma. Well? This is probably why this guy is the way he is, or was. Well, this time... Florian never got back up. Yeah, I had a feeling that was coming. Stanley cooked up the story that Florian had fallen down the stairs and hit his head in a terribly tragic accident. Anna went along with the story and nobody questioned it, not even the police. Stanley Kuklinski had beaten his seven-year-old son to death in front of his five-year-old brother. You never forget your first traumatic experience. You sure don't. Amen to that, brother. Amen. After the birth of two more children, Joseph and Roberta... So they decided to have more kids. Hell yeah, that's how you do it. You move on. Oh my god. You know? Like, yeah, that happened. Anyways. Yeah, we only killed our first child. Let's keep having more kids. I mean, I'm also not sure if these were, you know, 
let's say, consensual It doesn't pregnancies sound like that. it. Yeah, either way. So they had two more children, Joseph and Roberta. And after they were born, Stanley up and left his family for some other bitches. Good, bye. Like, like you guessed bye, earlier. Bye, Stanley. So at Hope a you young, have a horrible life. So at a young age, Richard already experienced the trauma of enduring abuse from both of his parents, abuse from his Catholic school teachers, witnessing the death of his brother, and being neglected by his father. But Richard wasn't the only child affected by growing up in a volatile household. Jumping ahead to 1970 for a moment... At age 25, his brother Joseph was arrested for a murder. Because that's why we're here. Talk to talk about murder. Murder. A murder. There's been a murder. A murder. A murder. <laughs> Joseph. Okay. Joseph had stolen 12-year-old Pamela Dial's dog and told the young girl that he had found her lost pet. Obviously excited to get her pet back from the seemingly good Samaritan. She was led by Joseph to the roof of 438 Central Avenue. It was on this rooftop that Joseph Kuklinski raped and murdered her. 25-year-old R-wording and murdering. You just like assaulting. Assault and murdered a 12-year-old. Like, why can't you just find someone your own age, you fucking loser? Or just don't. Well, I mean, not to rape them, but I mean yeah. to, like, date someone that will have sex with you. Yeah. But that that wouldn't be good enough. He wanted to ar- he wanted loser. assault and murder. So after doing so, he tossed her body and her dog over the side of a five-story building down to the ground below. The dog survived the fall. He just got a broken little paw. And his howling alerted the neighbors. He's like, ah! Or okay, I doubt he sounded like that. Ah! Ew, don't make that noise again. Ah! But, yeah, so he murdered her and threw her and the dog over, but the dog did survive. Wait, so this is the brother of the person we're talking about? Yeah, this is... Because now I'm starting to get a little confused. This is 25-year-old Joseph Kuklinski, so he grew up in the same household that Richard grew up in, so... Well, how old was he when his dad left? I'm not sure how old he was when his dad left, but like I said, him... Did, like, did he get beat up by his dad, or did his dad leave before any of that happened? I'm not exactly sure of that timeline, but he was fucking around with other women and, you know, left left the home sometime after he was born, so... Like, if I was that mom, I'd be like, get the fuck out of here. But police quickly arrested Joseph Kuklinski at his home, and he confessed to the crime. He eventually died in prison on September 22nd, 2003. Oh, good. When asked about his brother's murder of young Pamela Dial during an interview, Richard replied, we both come from the same father. So basically, like, yeah, I mean, no shit. Pretty much saying, like, I wasn't surprised he would murder someone. Right, so. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I might be surprised if my brothers murdered anyone. So, back to Richard. In addition to being abused by his less-than-loving parents as a child, Richard became a target for neighborhood bullies as well. Due to his small stature at the time, as he was often mocked by being called skinny and a dumb Polak. Kids in the 40s weren't very clever in the insult department. I mean, Fucking I like squares. A square? That's a... Squares? Or like a doorknob. Like a fucking dork. Dweeb. Like my dad says that sometimes. Moron. Like, like doorknob. <laughs> I think it's the funniest thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I wouldn't even be offended. I would just be like, that's the dumbest thing I've you ever fucking heard. Fucking knob. <laughs> I couldn't think of any other I ones. feel like someone else would call... Someone today would probably call us dumb Polacks. Um, and I don't like that. I mean, I think... That's offensive. I think we call it to each other. I probably said it to Nate before. Well, shout out to all our Polish listeners. Yeah, you dumb Polacks. No, anyway, don't say that. It's not nice. It's fine. I say it with love. I joke with love. Anyway, much like his mother's experience, Richard would also endure abuse from the nuns at his Catholic school where he acted as an altar boy, like I mentioned. Due to the extended period of abuse from his own mother and the nuns, he began to resent religion as a whole and even referred to his mother as cancer. Well... I can't really blame him. Basically (laughs) saying she killed everyone that she loved around her and stuff like that. I mean, she was put through a lot, so... 
Yeah, but then she passed it on to him as, you know, kind of followed Stanley's lead in beating the children. Well, yeah. I mean, so, she probably should have got her kids out of that situation. She but could I've have also been the escape, been, but... I've never been in that situation, so I can't really no. say. I've heard a bunch of things, and I can empathize with, you know, why it might be difficult to walk away, or they don't want to, or they can't, you know? Yeah. So, especially in the 30s, I'm sure it's... Well, yeah, because it's not like she could have a job. Well, I mean, she did. Actually, she worked in uh, some type of meatpacking factory. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure that was also after he left, though. So, you know, she had to. Yeah. But that's that. So Shout out to all the factory workers. Shout out to all my, my single mothers. Single mothers. Ma, so why did I say it like that? <laughs> I don't know. You're like, shout out to my single mothers. I couldn't decide between saying mamas and mothers, so I said <laughs> so, mothers. So said... <laughs> all the single mothers. All the single mothers. Doing what you got to do for your babies. For your babies. Anyway. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, he's fucking sick of religion because, you know, they used it as a reason to beat the shit out of him at school and all that stuff, you know. See, this is a problem I have. The with, fear of God and such. Well, this is a problem I have with religion in general when people use it like this. Yeah, that's no good. So, that's what happens. Or they use it to, like, justify other things. So, that's what happens. And then, so that's now. That's what happens. Now he's like, I don't want to deal with this no more. No more. So, what I'm going to do instead is, yo, he's like, yo, I'm 10 years old. And what I'm going to do to make myself feel better and deal with my trauma and my rage. Is not go to therapy. Is torture and kill animals. Oh. To assert power and feel control for once. You know what they say if you start killing animals. Yeah, that's a telltale sign. What is that called? I had it in here, but I took it out. It was it's, it's like, like the McDonald triad or something. It was triad. like triad, yeah. Um, like uh, abusing and murdering animals was one, and like excessive bedwetting was the other, and I forgot the other one, but I think it said only two of three are usually present in people that grow up to kill people sociopaths a spoiler alert Ugh, maybe not but yeah <laughs> i was like is it a spoiler uh, i don't know anything about this guy that's good so let me tell you so a couple of ways he would you know assert dominance over innocent little animals uh one example was tying the tails of two cats together and tossing them over a clothesline while watching them fight to the death. He would even throw them into the incinerator and watch them burn alive. Mm-hmm. So that's just a couple things. But as you just mentioned, a few years later in 1948, at age 13, the escalation to his first murder would come to fruition. At 13? 13. What were you doing when you were 13? I think I was trying to win concert tickets on Kiss 98.5. Well, you could have just murdered somebody and taken them. Like Richard would have. Well, my dad wouldn't take me and I couldn't drive. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, anyways, when Robert, oh my God, when Richard was 13, this is what he did. A group of neighborhood boys who called themselves the Project Boys began bullying Richard as he'd grown used to. But one day he decided that enough was enough. And he waited in the alley next to his apartment building for the boys to walk by as he knew they would. Richard stepped out and confronted the leader of the group, Charlie Lane. Armed with a two-foot wooden dowel that he had taken out of his closet, Richard was ready to rumble. What's a wooden dowel? So it's basically like like how in our closet that's bending because of all of your clothes, like the the stick that goes across it that you hang the hangers on. It's bending because of all of it's my clothes. It's bowing because of the weight of your clothing. <laughs> anyway, so he's ready to rumble. He's he's ready to go. So he began pummeling Charlie with the wooden rod until he eventually and apparently unintentionally bludgeoned him to death. It suggested that Richard had an early knack for murder. As he then apparently, apparently, ready, as he apparently, ready, I'm ready. ready to follow, as he apparently stole a car. So after he murdered this kid, he stole a car. Do you have a driver's license at 13? Doesn't matter. He stole it. 
put Charlie Lane's body in the trunk, drove around with the body in the trunk, stopped upon a bridge over a pond in South Jersey, grabbed a hammer, pliers, and a hatchet, broke and removed Charlie's teeth, cut his fingertips off, dumped the body into the frozen pond below. You know, typical 13-year-old stuff. These How kids is are crazy. How 13 pulling out someone's teeth? These wacky-ass kids, oh man. God. I tell you. Well, I, I, apparently he also was into, like, crime books and novels. Or not novels, like magazines. Like, you know, like they, detective. Like, told you how to like detective magazines and shit like that. Apparently he was way into those when he was a kid. So, maybe... I don't know. I mean, I don't think one of those is going to be like a manual on how to dismember a body. I don't know, but... You don't, you don't read. I read. You'll just have to take his word on all that because Charlie Lane's body was never found. Ever? Never. Well, that's sad for like his family. For never, never? Never, never? No, never. Kuklinski then tracked down the other boys in the group and used an iron rod to beat them nearly to death. And the lesson was quickly learned to not fuck with Richard Kuklinski. Well, maybe they shouldn't have bullied him. Yeah, otherwise. Not saying, like, you should bludgeon someone if they're bullying you, but, like. But. But that has, like, a. Really, also stand up for yourself well, at a certain point. Well, yeah, but not to kill someone. Yeah, I'm not condoning you murder them, but stand up for yourself. Give them a little punch in the mouth. Yeah, a little boop, boop. A little, little bop. Bop, <laughs> bop. As he mentioned during his first HBO interview titled The Iceman Tapes, Conversations Iceman. with a Killer. The Iceman. Quote, I was no... Should I try to do an accent? <laughs> He's got like a slight jersey. Sure. I was no longer taking the beating. I was giving it. And then with a smirk. And that's when I learned that it was better to give than to receive. Something like that. It's not, I just felt like we were on the side of the Sopranos for a second. Yeah. Well, I watched a lot of it. So transforming now into a six foot five, nearly three hundred pound monster of a man. Jeez, he's a beast. He soon formed a type of gang himself, known as the Gang Gang. Coming up Roses Gang Gang. Did you just say gang gang? Yes. <laughs> Coming up Roses was comprised of five fellas, three Polish, one Italian, and one Irish, and they all got matching rose tattoos on their left hands. They established their reputation by breaking into warehouses and liquor stores, robbing homes of wealthy New Jerseyans, and getting into good old-fashioned bar brawls. So are they like a gang, or are they becoming like a mob? Well, they're a gang gang, we just said. Oh, I didn't know if they were becoming like a mob. Well, at the at this point, especially through the bar brawls and their other illegal activities, it is at this point that this group of hoodlums caught the attention of the De Calvacante crime family. I've never heard of them. The De Calvacante crime family, also known as the North Jersey Mafia, was founded in the 1900s and operates mainly in northern New Jersey. And if you notice, I said operates because... They're still there today? They're still listed as active online. Okay, well, let's not see anything about them. I'm doing my best. I don't the, want to be, be next. The De Calvacante... Oh, my God. The De Calvacante crime family also inspired the creation of the De Mayo crime family, with Air Cole De Mayo acting as first boss of the family. That sounds familiar. Hold on. Okay. Not that one. So in this family, other key members include Giovanni Johnny Boy Soprano, Corrado Jr. Soprano, Polly Walnuts Galtieri, Richard Dickey Moltisanti and Richie April. I thought the Sopranos was fake. Well, you you understood what I said, but just in case you didn't, the real life Di Calvacante crime family was the inspiration behind the Sopranos. Oh. One of the greatest television series of all time. And you should w start watching it with me. I watched a couple episodes. Like, from the beginning and through. Anyways, that's another talk. <laughs> but, yeah. So, the monstrous and violent Richard Kuklinski and his gang was called upon by the DeCalvacante crime family member Carmine Genovese to carry out a hit to see just how tough they really were. Side note, 
Carmine Genovese was nicknamed Meatball due to his stocky frame and large round head. Meatball. Meatball. It's kind of like when your grandpa called you a linguine. Yeah. Come on, linguine. Yeah, whatever. Meatball. (laughs) For their first assignment, they were to execute a mark that they had trailed to a bar in Hoboken. As the man exited the bar, the chosen gunman chickened out. Richard took the gun from him and basically said, fuck you, I'll do it myself. So he got out of his driver's seat, walked up to the man sitting in his Lincoln, and boom, boom, shot him in the head. He casually walked back to the car, got in, and drove off. Each man in the group was paid $500 for the hit. It wasn't long before Carmine Genovese approached Richard with a second contract with two simple requests. Make sure he suffers and make the body disappear. If Richard could prove the target suffered, he would be paid double. Richard surveilled a used car lot where the target worked as a salesman in Newark, New Jersey, memorizing people's movements throughout the day when there would be potential witnesses, shit like that. It was time to set the plan in motion. Richard parked his vehicle a few streets over and approached the man at the car lot and explained to him he needed a cheap car ASAP as possible, and they embarked on a test drive together. After a few blocks, Kuklinski pulled over, parked, and popped the hood. While looking it over, he pointed out something in the engine block to the salesman. When the salesman leaned in to take a closer look, Richard pulled a lead pipe out of his pocket and smashed it over the mark's head. Damn. Damn. The salesman was hogtied, had his mouth duct taped shut, and was shoved into the trunk as Kuklinski drove the car to a wooded area in the Jersey Pine Barrens, which is also a Sopranos reference to the greatest Sopranos episode ever, Pine Barrens. So he's not part of this crime family? No. He's like a hired contractor? Yes. Hmm. That's exactly what he becomes. So he drags him out of the trunk, ties the man to a tree, and started to get to work, making sure this man suffered. For what reason did this man need to suffer? He didn't, knew? he didn't ask, nor did he care. So he pulls out a hatchet oh. Oh. and chops through his ankles. Oh. Then he cuts through his knees. Then he moves on to his fingers, hacking them off one by one. Initially, the fingers were to be the proof Genovese needed to be sure this man suffered. But Kuklinski had a better idea. After the deed was done... He drove to Carmine's house to let him know that the target was taken care of. When he asked where his proof was, Richard placed a plastic bag on his kitchen table. Curious, Genevieve separated the top of the bag. He had his proof. In the bag, on the table, was the man's head. I had a feeling. So... Richard Kuklinski had successfully proven his worth as a ruthless hired hitman and would soon be introduced to Gambino crime family associate Roy DeMeo. That's probably what you thought of earlier. DeMeo. Roy DeMeo before his career would really take off. The path to Roy DeMeo and the Gambino crime family began when Richard's contract with Carmine Genovese came to an end after Genovese was mysteriously shot and killed, forcing Kuklinski to find a new method of bringing in money. In 1960, Richard was 25 years old and working at a warehouse when he met 18-year-old Barbara Padrici. Aware of his violent nature, their boss confronted Richard to stay the fuck away from her, but he refused. Stay as, the fuck away from my daughter. Boop. As a result, he was fired. Fired. But Barb felt sorry for him and went on a date with him anyways. <laughs> You cuck- I'm just you gonna cuckoo laugh broads. because this sounds like what girls do. You cuckoo broads, you don't have to do that. Well, you're not a girl, so you don't understand. Well, you shouldn't have to do that because then sometimes bad things happen. Yeah. Eventually, they would strike up a relationship, even though Richard was married and had two kids at the time. Perfect. Classic. But assured her that he would divorce his wife, Linda, and Ugh. eventually he did. They always say that. Classic. Usually they don't. But he did. Barbara fell hard for Richard, as he did for her. But when she told him, she felt as if she hadn't seen her family enough as of late, and she wanted to take a break to slow things down. Richard pulled out a knife he kept strapped to his leg, and he stabbed her in the back. 
Oh, my God. Not figuratively, literally stabbed a knife into her back and told her, that is an object lesson. Never leave me. And threatened to kill her entire family if she did so. Um, okay, psycho. So what happened next? She died. They got married. <laughs> what? So well, not, it doesn't really sound like she had a choice. Not long after their marriage did Barbara realize she married two versions of Richard. Yeah, no kidding. Good Richie and bad Richie, yeah, as she described Richie. him. Quote from Barbara. When he was the good Richard, he couldn't have been nicer, more giving and considerate. When he was the bad Richard, he was the meanest bastard on the face of the earth. Well, yeah, I mean, this is how abusers are. And she found that out the hard way. They're nice one minute, and they're complete fucking assholes the next. That's what we call love bombing, right? No. That's a thing? No. That's a different thing. (laughs) That's called just being a jerk-off. Love bombing is like... When you first get in a relationship with someone, they're like, oh, my God, I like you so much. You're so pretty. Like, I'm in love with you. And you're like, fuck you, and don't talk they, to like, me, bitch. And then they, like, buy you a bunch of gifts. They make you, like, fall in love with them. They hook you in. It's like the, you know, like the fishing rod. Uh-huh. They're trying to reel you in. Oh, okay. You got to watch out for those guys that are like, oh, my God, you're so pretty. I like you so much. So, like, everyone I work with, you know? Mm-hmm. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> So Barbara ended up getting pregnant for the first time, but unfortunately miscarried after Richard made her sleep outside as punishment for smoking a cigarette while she was pregnant. So he's like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? You can't see my face right now, but... It's not good. I mean, it is good, but (laughs) her expression is disgust. Yeah. Disappointment. I mean, I'm pretty sure my mom smoked cigarettes the entire time she was pregnant with me. Shout out. Well, I mean, I want to recommend it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't. You don't have to do that, but you also shouldn't make your your pregnant wife sleep outside. Yeah, if she does. what the fuck, dude? So, after three other miscarriages due to Richard's violent outbursts, Barbara would again become pregnant and eventually the pair would have three children together. Daughters Merrick and Kristen, as well as a son, Dwayne. What happened to his other kids? They were miscarried. No, wasn't oh. he, like, married before? Oh, yeah. I didn't... Who knows? I didn't see anything <laughs> about that. He left them in the dust. <laughs> I didn't look... So, I mean, if one of those two kids happened to be listening or even alive, then I'm sorry, but I didn't look into you guys. But, luckily for old Rich, Barbara's uncle hooked him up with a job. You know, since he got fired for not leaving her alone. At the 20, 20th Century Deluxe Film Lab in Manhattan, where he eventually learned how to make copies of film reels and began to sell pirated copies of Disney's Cinderella and Pinocchio. Classic films. Before making the jump to distributing porn. <laughs> well, you know what? I don't know why I didn't think this was going to go there. A very natural progression indeed. I guess they didn't have porn hub. It was, what fucking year is it? <laughs> 60s kidding. now? Yeah, it's the 60s now, so... So obviously not. This was like, what do you call it? The analog version. Yeah, you gotta pop in that movie. Well, if you didn't have a magazine, it's a whole thing. You didn't have a Playboy? Yeah. Hustler? Hustler. Hustler. I don't know any other magazines. Uh, Penthouse. Oh, Penthouse, classic. Yeah, you wrote about Larry Flint. Yep. In the, what's his name? What the fuck's his name? Richard? No. Jo- Joseph. I forget. Something Franklin. It's a previous <laughs> episode. You can you can see it quicker than I'll be able to look it up. So. Joseph Paul Franklin. Joseph Paul Franklin, the racist killer. Yep. Go back and listen if you haven't. So, this eventually led to him running a production company that specialized in adult films funded by Roy DeMeo. Roy DeMeo was dead set on becoming a made man within the mob and was willing to do whatever it took to prove his own worth as a hitman. Being a ruthless killer and a former butcher, DeMeo would disassemble his victims, as he called it. Since most of these dismemberings took place in the basement of the Gemini Lounge, a bar he owned in Brooklyn, this process came to be known as the Gemini Method. Have you ever heard? No. I'll tell you. 
First, the target would be lured into the side door of the lounge where he'd be met almost always by Roy DeMeo himself, who would shoot him in the head with a silenced pistol and immediately apply pressure to the wound with a towel to restrict blood from flowing out. Then a second member of the crew would come in and stab the victim in the heart to provide any more blood flow from the gunshot wound before they stripped and dragged the body to the bathroom to drain any remaining blood from the body. Then, the body was laid out on plastic sheets where they would cut off the arms, the legs, and the head before placing the body parts and torso into plastic bags and cardboard boxes before taking them to the Fountain Avenue dump in Brooklyn. And that's the Gemini method. Jeez. Well, they So this guy is doing all this and he's not even a made man yet? He's trying to show his worth and he desperately wants to. He doesn't be a made man, you just had to like kill someone. That's the whole thing. I mean, obviously, I don't know. I don't know about this. Well, we did go to the mob museum. Oh, we did, and I, I like got I... sworn in via video. So <laughs> I pressed the button, and it's like, "Hey, welcome to the family," or whatever. I feel like I blacked out. There's like an museum. entire. Um, I don't want to say museum. ritual. Ritual is not the right word. It's like a ceremony. A ceremony. That's the word I'm looking for. But um, as as for requirements, the main thing is you had to be a hundred percent Italian. I mean, that would never work for me. Right. So Because I'm not Italian at all, I don't think. Um, so jumping a little bit ahead, that's why... That's why we're not having a lasagna for Christmas. That's also why <laughs> they they would approach Richard to help them out because he wouldn't be able to, you know, become a proper made man himself as he was not Italian. So he would work with them and all that, but he couldn't be... So what was Richard? Polish. Oh, Yeah. Like a hundred percent. Yeah. No. Well, his mom was Irish. Anyways, so wanting to first put Kuklinski to the test to see whether or not he was worthy of working with him, Roy DeMeo took him out for a drive, and they eventually parked on a residential street where he directed Richard to kill a man walking his dog down the sidewalk. Like for no reason. Not a selected target. Not a personal beef. Just an absolutely random guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, that sucks. So, Richard followed the order. He got out of the car, walked towards the man, and right as they passed by each other, Kuklinski turned around and shot the man in the head. Boom! Walked back to the car, and they took off. That was aggressive. So is shooting a man walking down the street for no reason. DeMeo was pleased, and Kuklinski immediately earned a special place in Roy DeMeo's blackened heart. The Mayo's first proper assignment for Kuklinski was to eliminate porn distributor Paul Rothenberg, whose activity warranted a police raid of a film lab in which they confiscated a quarter of a million dollars worth of film. While investigating Rothenberg's business dealings, they discovered several checks written out to Roy DeMeo, confirming their suspicions that the Gambino family was involved. Because of this, DeMeo decided that Rothenberg needed to be killed. Kuklinski tailed Rothenberg without his knowledge, and so too was Richard followed. Roy DeMeo followed closely to witness the hit himself. Rothenberg parked his car in a shopping mall parking lot, and when he exited his vehicle, Kuklinski did the same and pursued him on foot. Easily spotting the hulking monster of a man approaching him, Rothenberg booked it and took off running into an alley, where Kuklinski caught up to him and put a bullet in his head. Boop! The mayo was impressed with Richard's job and in exchange for eliminating Rothenberg, forgave his $50,000 debt that Richard owed to him. So just like that, Richard shot up the ranks as a trusted, reliable hitman for the mob and was soon called on to take care of any problems wherever he was needed. At this point, Richard Kuklinski was well versed in his methods to ensure that his targets suffered as much as possible before their deaths, but at that point did not have a preference. Handguns, sawed-off shotguns, knives... Molotov cocktails, strangulation, bludgeoning, ice picks, grenades, or just his bare hands. Whatever the situation called for. But somehow, he was able to escalate even further. Upon receiving a contract, he tased the guy, bound his hands and feet before driving him to the woods in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It was here that he led him to a cave, stripped him of his clothes, and tied him down. As the target was screaming and pleading for his life, Richard laughed as he pulled out his trusty knife and began slicing up his face, arms, and legs. 
The blood was sniffed out quickly by the native rats living in the cave, and they quickly came out for feeding time. Ew. Before leaving the rats to literally eat the man alive, Richard set up a video camera and let it roll. So, he's letting rats Dude, he's eat this man alive. When he returned to the cave two days later, all that was left was a pile of bloody leaves and bones. So he gathered up the bones and dumped them down a ravine on his way out of the woods. He allegedly showed the videotape to Roy DeMeo and his crew, who were impressed with his fine work. And like I just mentioned, they told him if he wasn't Polish, they'd sponsor him to be a made man in the family immediately. But they were like, "Mm, but you're not, so sorry. But you can't, so we're just going to keep using you to, you know, take care of these people, take care of these rats. In 1980, Richard Kuklinski was called upon by well-known Gambino family associate and eventual informant, Salvatore Gravano, a.k.a. Sammy the Bull. Have you ever heard? That sounds familiar. I've mentioned him before. To do what else but carry out a hit because Hitman. So he just, like, helps every mob family? Yes, but he's currently just mostly working with Gambinos, but... I thought the other guy was DeMeo. Well, that's his his name. The fictional DeMeo family was what the Soprano family was. It started out as different spellings, but the Soprano, never mind. So is the DeMeo guy part of the Gambino family? Yes. Oh, okay. Listen, mob stuff gets very confusing. I know, but it's very fascinating, and I might do more of it. So on a snowy March evening, Kuklinski was given a walkie-talkie by Gravano, as well as a photo and a description of Peter Calabro. Kuklinski parked his van on the side of the road with his hazard lights on, forcing cars to pass by slowly as he hit around the front of it. So it's kind of like a wooded area, so it's like a small road, you know, like Mm -hmm. a curvy, whatever. At around 2 a.m., he spotted his target, and as the Honda Civic slowly rolled past the front of his van, Kuklinski stepped out and fired a shotgun three times through the driver's side window, (gasps) 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 (gasps)
no matter what I did, I couldn't get that leg in there. So I had to cut it. Do what you got to do. That's what I always say. So he cut he cut the one leg, like the tendons and whatnot, and folded his, his, Ew, uh. his, his whole body into a 55-gallon drum. He then drove to Jersey City and dumped the drum in an alleyway near the Chemitex chemical plant where a dented steel drum and a bloodied leg sticking out of it was spotted by a passerby just the next morning. Kuklinski would allegedly use this drum method fairly regularly, sometimes even then leaving the drum in a car, driving the car to a junkyard, and having the car crushed along with the contents. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. So when I mention Mr. Softy, what do you think? I think of the ice cream truck. The ice cream truck, right? You know, other summer, right? It's hot. Childhood. The jingle. I mean, I think this summer you got me a ice cream cone from Mr. Yeah, Softy. I did. It, it wasn't the best, but it did it did what it was it, supposed to it do. It does what it does. So, one day, while waiting to carry out a hit, Kuklinski was waiting in his car with a tranquilizer gun. Oh, you know, casual. A new addition to his killing inventory. This particular summer day was dummy hot. Dummy hot. And he was sweating like a hoe in church. Suddenly, he hears that familiar jingle we all remember hearing while the ice cream truck drove up and down the streets in our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. If you grew up in a city, at least. I don't know about the rural people, so sorry, country people. Richard flagged the truck down and probably wanted a twist on a cone with rainbow sprinkles or some shit to cool off. When he approached the window, he realized he had run into the man a few days prior at a hotel in Queens, Robert Prongay. Robert Prongay was a former Special Forces soldier with an extensive knowledge of explosives and killing. Robert Prongay, much like Kuklinski, was a contract killer. After sitting down to share notes and pick each other's murderous brains, Prongay told Richard that he drives a Mr. Softy truck as a cover to do surveillance on his targets. Brilliant. Who would ever suspect that the ice cream man serving children ice cream could very well be on his way to kill one of their fathers that same day? It was at this point that Prongay introduced Kuklinski to his new favorite killing method, poison. More specifically, cyanide. More on that in a moment. On April 29th, 1982, pharmacist Paul Hoffman pestered Kuklinski to make a deal for a shipment of Tagamet at a minimal price. It was a prescription medicine for ulcers, which he'd turn around to stand to gain a major profit in his pharmacy. When Hoffman made it to Kuklinski's warehouse, he showed him the $25,000 cash that he had brought for the deal. In Kuklinski's own words, he says, what are we going to do? How am I going to get this merchandise? I put the gun under his chin, and I said, there is no merchandise, and I shot him. He didn't die. Oh. The gun jammed. He was gargling. Blood was pouring out of his mouth. And uh, it looked like he was in a lot of pain. So there was a tire iron there. I took the tire iron and hit him with it, which knocked him out. And uh, he died. I then took him. I put him in a 50-gallon drum and put it on the side of a motel. Oh, how he's just, like, dropping bodies everywhere. Also, if you... I try to read it as closely to he actually speaks because... You can watch the interviews, but he, like, takes a long fucking time, you know? Mm -hmm. So, it's interesting, though. You should go watch those. But the drum stayed on the side of Harry's motel for days. Kuklinski would check on it every day eavesdrop on conversations to hear if anybody mentioned anything about it. He even reportedly ate lunch next to it, using the drum as a table, because there was also a nearby hot dog stand. Yummy hot dogs. Little glizzies. A glizzy action for... Glizzy for Richie, that's what I say. Oh, yeah. But one day, it was gone, and he had no idea where it went. Paul Hoffman's body was never found. Damn. So it was probably taken to the dump. Like, do you think the people that work there were like, what is this drum doing here? <laughs> Let's just take it to the dump. Well, that's why we kept checking in and see if anybody said anything or was suspicious about it or anybody did anything about it. But it was just one day it was just gone. In December 1982, Percy House, a member of Kuklinski's burglary gang, was arrested. 
Warrants were also issued for two other group members, including Daniel Deppner and 37-year-old Gary Smith. Kuklinski urged Smith and Deppner to lay low, and they rented a room at the York Motel in North Bergen, New Jersey. At one point, Smith went to visit his daughter, but Kuklinski was worried that after previous rumblings, he would flip and become an informant. So, don't, don't he's, gotta, he's gotta go. So, Richard got some dinner for them when Gary Smith returned. Just some guys sharing a couple burgers. Dude stuff. Just dudes being dudes. Not exactly sure what toppings were on the burgers. You know, you got your cheese, your onions. Your lettuce, lettuce tomato. Your tomatoes. Uh, but Ketchup. Sh- sure, mayo, mayo. With mustard, whatever. But Chef Richie made sure that Gary's burger had cyanide on it. Classic. Gary finished his burger quickly, much to the delight of Kuklinski and Deppner. Gary's eyes rolled to the back of his head, and he fell to the floor. But the cyanide didn't work well enough, and he didn't die. Probably wasn't the right dose. So, Daniel Deppner pulled a cord from the lamp inside of the room and strangled him with it. Oh, wow, that took a turn. When Barbara Deppner didn't return with the getaway vehicle to move his body, Richard and Danny Boy had to think fast. Over the next four days, after they checked out in the room of the middle of the night, the subsequent guests in that room complained of an odd smell. Nobody could place exactly what it was, until the motel manager inspected the room for the source of the stank. Gary Smith's decomposing body was discovered between the mattress and the box spring. They just shoved him under the bed. People rented this room and slept on a mattress on top of a dead body for the next four days. Never mind whatever else they might have done on that mattress. Oh my God. So next time you're in a motel, check the mattress. Well. Especially a motel. Remember when we stayed in a motel? Yeah. It was gross. Yeah, there's, I don't think there was any room under that mattress because it was just like on a wooden box, it felt like. That I kept hitting my shins on. Anyways, it was fine. It was a fine room. We had it one night. It was fine. Was it? It was fine. It was whatever. It was what it was. According to forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden. Have you ever heard? No. Okay. Dr. Michael Bodden, the focus of the autopsy series on HBO... Back in the day, which might have accidentally first introduced me to the world of death as a child, because I saw it on HBO. Why were you allowed to watch that? I, I wasn't. <laughs> it's not like my I was watching it with my mom, and she's like, look, a headless, armless look, torso. a dead body. <laughs> That's the thing that stuck with me about it, and then I watched it like semi-recently again, and I yeah, saw I, the episode. I remember you watching it. And I was like, "That's yep, there it is. Anyways, um, it was about this... Dr. Dr. Bodden, and he would, like, talk about the victims and this and that. It's a fascinating show if you're interested and can stomach crime scene photos and all that shit. Dr. Bodden mentioned that if Gary Smith was not strangled with a cord and his body did not show evidence of ligature marks around his neck, his death would have most likely been attributed to natural causes or a drug overdose. But instead, it was ruled a okay, homicide. Okay, hold on. So they find a body under a mattress in between a box spring, and they're like... <sighs> Could have been natural causes. <laughs> what? Or, or drugs. How would your body end up on... Un- no. No. There's no way. Or drugs. Like, if you you're... You can't place yourself under there and be like, I'm going to just rest in peace here. Uh, drugs. You're, you're There's no up. way. Even if you're doing drugs, you're not going to put yourself under a mattress. Well, see, you're talking about being by yourself. I'm saying, like, you know, I've never been in this world per se, but I've watched a lot of things. So let's say you're shooting up whatever with a buddy and or he fucking dies and then you panic and then you just stuff him under the mattress and check out, which is what they did in the middle of the night, you know? So. No. Okay. Next. Um, on May 14th, 1983, a bicyclist riding through a wooded area in West Milford, New Jersey, noticed a large vulture picking at what looked like a pile of trash. But this was no pile of trash, as you might have guessed. It was the partially eaten body of the previously mentioned Daniel Deppner. 
His autopsy showed pinkish spots on his skin, which is a sign of cyanide poisoning, and there was a noticeable lack of defensive wounds. So, Daniel Deppner, the one that helped hide Gary Smith under the mattress. Oh, he killed him He's now also dead and has evidence of cyanide poisoning on his skin and a lack of defensive wounds, which would imply that he was poisoned. Dang. Otherwise, he probably would have fought back. Another finding during Daniel Deppner's autopsy was the undigested food in his stomach, most notably burnt beans. Ew. This suggested it was a homemade meal and not served at a restaurant. Deppner was Kuklinski's third associate to be found dead. Around the same time frame, Richard began to utilize large industrial freezers in the warehouse he owned to store the bodies of his victims. Oh. He would keep the bodies frozen for months or even years before dumping them, which would skew the actual time of death during an autopsy, allowing him to continue on undetected. How many people has he killed? He claims that he's killed 200. I mean, it's starting to sound like it. We'll get to that. So one of the bodies that he would that he ended up keeping in a freezer was Louis Masgay, who was found near a park in Orangetown, New York, with a bullet hole in the back of his head on September 25th, 1983. But we need to jump backwards real quick. On July 1st, 1981, just over two years prior, he met with Kuklinski to purchase a monstrous inventory of VHS tapes to flip for a profit. Because it's 1981. Mm-hmm. Masgay had brought $95,000 with him to complete the transaction. When the deal went south, Kuklinski ended up putting several bullets into Masgay. Boom, 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 boom. I don't know how many. Several. <laughs> and stored his body in the freezer. But when it was time for him to get rid of the warehouse, Kuklinski had to move the body before the next renter would take over. Because, you know, you don't want to forget that there. Under the impression that once he dumped the body near the park, it would take days or even weeks to be discovered. But Masgay's body was found only a day or two later. On a very warm September day, the medical examiner noted ice crystals inside of the body during the autopsy. The body hadn't properly thawed, as Kuklinski had not left enough time for the body to do so. He also wrapped the body in plastic bags that kept it insulated and partially frozen. So is this how he gets the nickname, the Iceman? Literally the next line I wrote reads, (laughs) This is how Richard Kuklinski had come to earn the nickname, the Iceman. The Iceman. The Iceman. So. So he killed this guy and then, like, kept him in his freezer and then he's just dumping the body now? Well, because he sold his warehouse, so he had to make sure he got rid of it because, you know, someone else is going to take over the place. So he's got to get rid of it because it's. You know, a fucking dead body. And so the idea would be to leave the body out and let it thaw out. So then the police or whoever would find a body and then the police would investigate and their findings would be like, oh, it's based on our findings. He was killed 12 hours ago. Mm -hmm. You know, so he didn't leave enough time for it to properly thaw. And they found ice crystals inside of his body. And that's how they found out that he was freezing people. Yeah. In 1984, Mr. Softy, if you remember, Robert Prongay, was found shot to death in his truck in his garage. His garage was right across the street from Kuklinski's warehouse. While it's unclear if Kuklinski was responsible for Mr. Softy's death, it ultimately cut off his source for obtaining his trusty cyanide. So at this point... Richard Kuklinski had been involved with narcotics, pornography, arms dealing, money laundering, hijacking, and contract killing. He's just dabbling in a couple things. He's just uh, doing it all, man. Kuklinski's actions over those past several years had garnered the attention of Pat Kane. The hockey player? Pat Kane was born in Buffalo, New York, and was drafted first overall by the (laughs) Chicago Blackhawks in the 2007 NHL draft. Not that black. Wait, wait. Why did you say black Kane? Pat Kane. Wait, hold on. That's the wrong Pat Kane. Agent Pat Kane was a New Jersey State police officer who built a case file to eventually bring down the Iceman. 
Cain noted that in five unsolved homicide cases, Hoffman, Smith, Deppner, Mazgay, and Malaband, mm-hmm. Kuklinski was mentioned to have been the last person they all had contact with. And, like, no one before this, like, put that together. That's suspicious. That's weird. That's weird. So a task force was created between the New Jersey Attorney General's Office, New Jersey State Police Organized Crime Task Force, and the ATF. What year is this? 1984. Okay. So in 1984, Van Halen's album, 1984, was released. That's Thank you. That's all I got. 1984 was the year before 1985 when Back to the Future came out. Mm-hmm. Their operation code name was Operation Iceman. Operation Iceman. Yeah. To execute their plan to get to Kuklinski, they enlisted the help of ATF Special Agent Dominic Polifrone, who went undercover for 18 months to get close to Kuklinski. In order to do so, Kane recruited Kuklinski's close friend, Phil Solomine, to introduce the two. Polifrone's undercover persona was Michael Dominic Provenzano, a.k.a. Dom. Dom. A, a criminal with connections to the mob. I feel like if your name is Dom, you like, like have to be in the mob. Like Dom Toretto? Yeah. We're all family. <laughs> yeah, just like that. I live my life on quarter mile at a time. Uh-huh. Or whatever. That was pretty good. Yeah. So... Polifrone slash Provenzano recorded Kuklinski discussing a body he had stashed in a freezer for two and a half years, talking about his preference for poisoning and even bragging about killing a man by feeding him a cyanide-laced hamburger. Dom came to Richard with another contract, albeit a phony one, because keep in mind, this is a sting operation now. Mm -hmm. December 17th, 1986. Richard arrived an hour late to meet with Dom, but upon his arrival, he produced the requested merchandise. As the other agents in the task force listened in on Dom's hidden microphone concealed in his jacket, Richard showed Dom a semi-automatic rifle and a suppressor, which he sold to Dom for $1,100. In the 1980s, the sale of a suppressor or a silencer was a felony, and a major one. Dom then asked Kuklinski to take care of a rich Jewish kid whom he'd been supplying with cocaine. Just keep in mind, it's, this is made up. The kid was asking for more product, and so the plan was to meet with him, take the money and the product, and get rid of the kid. The method of murder was to be a cyanide-laced egg sandwich, which Dom would provide. Once the kid was taken care of, they'd split the money. <laughs> so hold on, they're just going to like roll up to this kid... Try to sell him cocaine and be like, hey, I brought this egg sandwich. Do you want it? I guess. I don't know. I'd be like, no. <laughs> so like, hey, this cocaine dealing's getting me a little hungry. Yeah, you like, want hey, some you egg? Want this sandwich? You want some okay. egg? I don't know. I mean, obviously it works since he like poisoned all those other people. Well, Richard agreed to this deal and took the sandwich and cyanide from Dom. All while the Operation Iceman agents are listening live. Dom was going to pick up the target to bring him back, and Richard was to drive his van down the road to meet them at the spot. But Richard told them his wife needed him and he had to go home. The agents were confused as to where the hell he had gone, and a couple of them were assigned to drive by his home every 20 minutes or so when they spotted him unloading groceries in his driveway. Fifteen unmarked cars ditched their original stakeout spots and sped towards his neighborhood. Wait, so they sped towards his neighborhood because he unloaded groceries? Well, because the entire operation, the plan was to catch him in the act of making this deal to kill this kid. And he veered off and went home, so they had somebody case in the place, and they spotted him at home, so they're like, he's not coming back to the meeting spot. Yeah. So we gotta go fucking get him. You know? Hmm. Um, it's also, I also heard another story that he was suspicious of the cyanide that he was given mm-hmm. and he checked it out and he stopped at a fast food place and bought a burger and he put this cyanide on the burger and fed it to a dog that was in the parking lot 
And he was just looking at him, waiting for him to die from it, and he didn't. So he knew it was So then he grew suspicious, and he's like, he didn't quite think that he was being set up by the police, but he just thought it was a phony deal. So that's that's also a reason why he was thought to have went home Mm -hmm. instead. But Richard loaded Barbara into their car, and they were going to go head out to get some breakfast, because apparently she told him she wasn't feeling so well. And aside from his violent outbursts, he loved her, so. Oh, besides beating her up, he so he's loved like, her. let's go get some. Making her sleep outside when pregnant. Let's go get some uh, moons over my hammy. So they're in the car, they're headed out, and suddenly their car was surrounded by the Operation Iceman Task Force, and they took the Iceman into custody, while his wife sat in the passenger seat in utter horror and confusion. According to Paula Frone, during the takedown, they also found the three egg sandwiches. Hmm. Quote, the plan was to put cyanide in one and feed it to the rich kid. Later, a lab determined that all three sandwiches had been laced with cyanide. He was going to kill me that day, too. But like he often said, he who hesitates is lost. Dang. So he felt like he was getting set up for a deal and then he took those dumbass egg sandwiches and put actual cyanide on them for like him the police guy and then the made up child yeah so he's gonna kill himself that all three had been laced yeah that doesn't make sense huh no <laughs> yeah I don't know where the third one was for then his wife mm, no I don't know that's just what Polifron said Agent Pat Kane told Kuklinski the jig was up. It's over, Buster. Get in the paddy wagon. Yeah. Get, you're done, bucko. You know? Mm-hmm. The Iceman. That's what I would have said. The Iceman is Dunzo. Dunzo. January 25th, 1988. Where were you? Not alive. Okay. Well, the Iceman was on trial for the murders of Daniel Deppner and Gary Smith. While the prosecution was seeking the death penalty, their case was based on circumstantial evidence. Agent Polifrone, a.k.a. Dom, took to the stand and testified about his encounters with Kuklinski. The audio tapes were played of Kuklinski telling Dom how to use cyanide in food, how long it took one of his victims to die, and how he had to take care of some rats. Some rats. Richard's defense attorney, Neil Frank, argued that Kuklinski was trying to come off as a tough guy. And these statements were nothing but braggadocious and that no autopsy had shown any indication of cyanide in the victims. So he's saying, like, hey, he's just trying to be cool. I mean, he sounds like an actual tough guy if he's, like, hacking people to pieces. He's trying to just show off, you know. Stabbing people in the back. Show you how tough he is. Well, But those things weren't caught on on tape. (laughs) Okay, but they still happened. Okay, well, you know, we're talking about the tape and that's why... The Neil, tape? Why are we talking like we're That's why Neil that. Frank, he's like, hey, what the fuck are you talking about? What does it matter? He's being a tough guy. He's putting on a front. Tough guy Tony? Tough guy Tony. Tough guy Richie. <laughs> and that no autopsy shown any indication of cyanide in the victims. What are you talking about? <laughs> However, Dr. Michael Bodden, if you remember, also testified that after a few days inside of the body, cyanide degrades to no detectable trace but it does show up in the form of pink spots on the skin. Which they all had. Evident on photos of both bodies. Mm-hmm. Pathologist Geetha Natarajan. <laughs> shout out Geetha. Geetha? Indicated, indicated that ligature marks on Gary Smith's neck were consistent with strangulation. On May 25th, 1988, it took the jury four hours to return with a verdict. The jury found Richard Kuklinski... Guilty. Do you think so? Are you kidding? It's not going to be guilty? No, he's guilty. In the murders of Gary Smith and Daniel Deppner, but he would not face the death penalty. When the task force agents ripped Kuklinski out of his car while on the way to go to breakfast with Barbara, they charged her with possession of an illegal firearm, as there was a gun in the car, although she hadn't known. Oh, poor Babs. So, before the second trial for the murders of Louis Masgay, Paul Hoffman, and George Malaban began, the district attorney offered Richard a deal. 
the possession of an illegal firearm charge against Babs and a drug charge against one of their children, not which sure which one, would be dropped if Kuklinski confessed in order to forego another trial. Richard accepted the deal and confessed to the murders of Mazgay and Malaband, but only led them to where he'd left Hoffman in the drum next to Harry's motel. So in total, Richard Kuklinski was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences for Mazgay and Malaband. At the time of sentencing, at age 53, he wouldn't have been eligible for the possibility of parole until he was 110 years old. Later in 2003, I mentioned before, he also admitted to the murder of policeman Peter Calabro, which added 30 more years to his sentence. But at that point, it was mostly a symbolic sentence. Yeah. So on March 5th, 2006, where were you? I don't know. Okay. I think I was a freshman in high school. Okay. Well, that's when Richard Kuklinski died at 70 years old. The timing of his death is seen as suspicious by some because he was set to testify in court against Sammy the Bull Gravano, whom he claimed recruited him to kill Peter Calabro. But since he died before he could do so, the charges against Gravano were dropped. Ooh, so he probably had him killed. Well, in October 2005, about seven months before his death, Kuklinski was diagnosed with Kawasaki disease. Was that? It's a form of vasculitis wherein medium-sized blood vessels throughout the body become inflamed and can lead to heart issues. Oh, so maybe he just died. Well, the strange part that I saw about Kawasaki disease is that it mostly affects children under five years of age. How did he have it? That's a good question. I mean, I don't think you can just get Kawasaki disease. That's a good question. Can you? I don't think so. I'm not a doctor no uh, more. Doctor? I ain't no doctor no more, but I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> what is happening to you? <laughs> but the aforementioned Dr. Baden, again, he pops up here, confirmed at the request of Kuklinski's family that Richard died of cardiac arrest. Just a week before his death, the St. Francis Medical Center in Trenton, New Jersey, called Barbara to ask if she wanted to rescind the do not resuscitate order. She did not. Obviously. She's like, get this fuck face away from me. Even though he was like, yeah, resuscitate me. And then we're like, well, I don't know about that. Probably shouldn't. (laughs) And they're like, yo, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, 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 don't. She was like, hell yeah, but. While in prison, Kuklinski was a subject of the HBO documentary The Iceman Tapes, Conversations with a Killer, where he discusses his life and career of killing. Uh, There was also a couple other ones after that in, I want to say, 98 or so in 2001. So there's like basically three parts of this. Um, But yeah, they're on HBO. You can watch them. There was a 2012 film based on Richard Kuklinski, Simply titled, The Iceman. The Iceman. The Iceman stars Michael Shannon as Richard Kuklinski. Ray Liotta, Big Rip, as Roy DeMeo. Winona Ryder as Deborah, who is Barbara. Oh, I was like, who the hell is Deborah? She probably just didn't want her name attached to it or something, I would think. You know, so they probably probably changed some names, but Winona Ryder is... Babs. Michael Shannon's wife in the film. Um, Chris Evans, oh, a.k.a. Chris Evans. Captain America, as Mr. Freezy. Oh. Who do you think that is supposed to be, if you Mr. remember? Mr. Softy? Mr. Softy, I would think. And James Franco as Marty Freeman. Uh, while Kuklinski claimed to have murdered upwards of 200 people in various gruesome ways, many, po- many people believe he was full of shit. Really? There's no denying he was a violent, damaged, unhinged man starting at a very young age, but there's probably a reason he was only on trial for and convicted of five murders. Mm, Yeah. Kuklinski also claimed to have been one of the gunmen recruited by John Gotti to kill Gambino crime family boss Paul Castellano 
as well as being involved in the hit on a Bonanno crime family acting boss Carmine Galante, and also claimed to have been the guy who killed his former business partner, Roy DeMeo. So I was mostly trying to focus on the ones that he was sentenced for. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of more solid because, like I just said, a lot of people think he made a lot of this shit up, exaggerated a bunch of shit. So it's hard to tell what might be true. And especially when he's getting all this attention, like after he was in jail, he's like, hey, HBO, come talk to me. Yeah. You know, he's a lot of people believe he was putting on a show, especially at that point. So Kuklinski even admitted his involvement with four others in the kidnapping and murder of infamous Teamsters president Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, Jimmy Hoffa. Who was also never found. So. So maybe he put him in one of those drums and bye. Bye-bye. That's actually what he said. Really? He said he put him in what, well, if I recall correctly, it was something like he was in the back seat of the car with three other guys, and then Jimmy got in the passenger seat up front, and then he stabbed him in the top of the head, and then they stuffed him into a drum, and then put him in the trunk of a car inside the drum, and then took it to the junkyard, and then crushed the car, and that's it. I mean, yeah, if you do that, no one's going to find you. And nobody ever did, so... But again, he's placing himself in like all these infamous, well-known mob hits or, you know, disappearances and stuff. And some most people are like, I don't think so, because none of them can be substantiated. And the only proof is his word. So authorities don't buy most of what Richard claimed he had done. And many former Gambino crime family associates have also questioned the validity of his claims. Some saying they never even heard of the guy during the time he was active. Well, I mean, they're not going to be like, yeah, I know him. But then again, wouldn't the main point of being a professional hit hitman be... Is because I'm not a minute. As an quiet anonymous. as possible. So, maybe. Plus, like, the people who hired you aren't going to be like, yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, I Seen mean, him a couple times. <laughs> I mean, he's dead now. So, yeah, but they wouldn't have any dead, reason to lie about it. They're still not going to say they know him. They're not going to be associated with any crimes. Like, did you ever watch that guy, Michael Francese, say, Mike Francese, whatever his name is, on YouTube? No. He's like a former mob guy, and oh, he talks guy. about all that stuff. Oh, that he's like, turned state's evidence. He's like, I don't, I've never heard this fucking guy in my life. And he's like, you know, and I was around the Gambinos and this and that. I've never once heard about him until he started saying he was involved with us or something. Yeah, but he's a hitman. You're not going to know him. That's, so, I mean, hey, I'll go for that. So, maybe. But... I'm sure I've also left out plenty of things here, but as I mentioned, it's hard to determine exactly what is and what isn't bullshit. So, I'd like to give a specific shout to the infamous America podcast, who produced a very well done six-part series titled The Iceman. And that's more on the storytelling side and contains plenty more stories than I've given you today. So, Hmm. you know, like I said, I... Mostly focused on, like, the ones that he was on trial for and whatever, and it's kind of kind of more proven than the other ones because there's, there's so many more stories I could have told you, and I'm already clocking, like, an hour and a half here. I feel like with mob stuff, I need, like, a freaking family tree. Yeah. Because I can't remember everything. Yeah, I know. There's a lot. So, so that's what I was doing with that, and... That's the story of the Iceman, the Richard Ice Kuklinski. Man. So, some people say that he was solely a serial killer, but then they say he doesn't really fit the serial killer, what do you call, template, I guess, where he didn't kill for, like, sexual arousal or well, anything you know? else. He was just killing for mostly for money, and... He says in his interviews he felt nothing. He doesn't regret any of them, except one. I forget which. But he felt nothing. He just did it because he had to do it. Shit like that. Okay, well, that's not, like, normal. Well, yeah. He he watched his brother get beat to death by his dad when he was five. So there's your basis for that. You know? Because then he see And And then then he decided to stab his wife in the back. Because then, you know, when he sees them covering up the murder of his brother as something else and getting away with it, he's like, oh, life is expendable. 
So he's like, I'm you know? 13. I can kill my bully. He's like, these these bodies are expendable. I could just kill people and cover it up and no, nobody will know. No one will know. No. Yeah. So. How would they know? They're going to know. <laughs> so, again, was he a serial killer, a freelance mob connected hitman, or just a violent pathological liar? I don't know. That's that's up to you to decide, you know. So, again, there's a million things out there. Go watch the, the Iceman tapes. But, like I said, he's kind of drawn out and takes a while to answer things. But probably most likely because he's also trying to make shit up to make it sound more hardcore. I don't know. Mm, maybe. So, that's uh, that's the point where I tell you that we got the, the social medias. Because I always forget at the beginning. Even though we're, I think this is number 13 now. Mm-hmm. That sounds right. 14, maybe. Yep. Who knows? Somewhere around there. Anyway, uh, Dead Spot Pod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and the email is deadspotpod at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. That's all I got for you this time. Uh, thank you if you made it this far, and I uh, hope you come back for the next one. Okay, bye. Bye bye.